read this really interesting paper about the way that we dress and how it affects people's response to us. And basically the idea is if somebody is too perfectly dressed, we don't trust them all that much. And this is the time period in which Hannibal is trying to lay low. He's meeting Jack really for the first time. He doesn't want to draw a lot of attention to himself. So by wearing a suit that has some flaws in it, he's not perfectly dressed and he's flying a little bit under the radar. And what specifically is the problem is, you can see that the shoulders are a little too big. There's a little bit of a gap between his vest and his pants. In the show itself, the sleeves are a little too short. When you're wearing a suit, if the jacket is properly fitted, when your arms are down, you should have the jacket touch about this knuckle on your thumb. And you can see that his sleeves are hitting right at the wrist. We're getting a little peek of his shirt, even though he doesn't have his arms stretched out. And furthermore, the colors are kind of terrible. He looks like he's dressed for Easter and not really for work in that pastel blue and really pale cream yellow. There's not a lot of contrast. It's just, it's an ugly suit, but it's perfect for what it is. And judging by the fit, it definitely isn't bespoke. You wouldn't go to a tailor and ask them to custom make something that fits you really badly. That would kind of draw attention to him. This is probably what's called a made to measure suit or even off the rack. And really quick, the difference between bespoke and made to measure. When you get a bespoke suit, the tailor takes measurements of your whole body and then they create a pattern that is specific to you from those measurements. So they keep that pattern on file. Anytime you come back, they'll pull it out and they'll make you a new suit based on it. You choose all of the details. There's a lot of hand sewing. There's just a lot that goes into it that drives the cost up. And I'll get into those specifics later when I talk about my suit. But you're looking at probably at least eight to $10,000 for a really, really good bespoke suit. Made to measure, which is probably what this suit is, is you go in, they check your measurements and they use a standard pattern that's about the right size for you. You still get to pick out the fabric. You still get to pick out the details like the buttons and some of the styling, but it's not custom fitted to you. And you'll go in and you'll try it on and they'll hem the pants to be the right length and maybe do some small alterations, but it's not really that custom, even though it still can cost a couple thousand dollars. Then off the rack is pretty obvious. That's when you go into a suit shop, you pick a suit, you buy it. They might hem the pants there at the suit shop, but you're gonna spend a few hundred dollars for something that's already made and you've decided the fit is pretty good. And later when I talk about the other characters in the show, I'll also talk a little bit about which characters are probably wearing which suit type. But for now, moving on. This is from the same episode. And this is when we, hello? It's Betsy, I just wanna interrupt you for a second. Yeah. Um, I think we're all still seeing your thumbnails. Really? Yep, just we see you over to the right, very small, and then mm -hmm. we see your folders and then your thumbnails. Okay. So if you're double... it's full screen on my screen. Okay. Um, hold on. Okay. Now do you see him? Yay! Okay, I'm so sorry. I went through all of that without noticing. Um, okay, so this is the suit that I was talking about. Let's take a minute and like bask in his glory. But you can see now the details that aren't really right. You can see that his sleeve is too short. The fit kind of sucks. The colors are ugly. 
And now let me move on to the second photo. So can everybody see Hannibal in the brown jacket eating dinner? Cool. Okay, now I know what I'm doing. So anyways, this is from the same first episode, but this is Hannibal in his home. We can see that he's got a paisley tie on. The jacket fits a little better. He's a little bit fancier because he's comfortable. He's eating privately. And this is really the start of where we get the paisley colors in and he's going to become a little bit more flashy. When I... So then he moves into the dark blue suits. He's got a paisley tie. Unlike the first suit, he's got this notched lapel that's really dramatic. He's pattern mixing. You can see that his um, pocket square and his tie and his shirt don't exactly match. But he's getting a little bit more of his own style, even though the colors we're seeing are still really restrained. If you saw a man working at like a lawyer's office or a bank in this kind of suit, you really wouldn't be too surprised to see these colors. But as we go through the season, you can see now his color palette is lightening up. We've got a light blue shirt. We've got these checks that are a little bit more visible because the pattern of the fabric is lighter. And we're starting to see more bespoke suit details in the buttonhole and it's really hard to see. Um, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. Come on. But there's some little pinpricks around the edge of his lapel, and that's a specific type of stitch that's just decorative for a bespoke suit and adds a little bit more to the cost. So he's starting to show off that he's a man with taste and style and also money to burn on his style. And then every now and then he pops up with this fancy dad look where he's got the suit jacket, he's got his little zippered down polo. It looks a little bit English country gentleman, but still we're getting more of the checkers and the stripes and the different textures mixed where he's starting to show off a little bit. He's in the zone, he's teaching his murder daughter right here, so he can be a little more flashy. And then by midway through the season, which Brian specifically talked about the episodes mid-season being sort of a reset of the show where they decided they wanted to change the tone and make it, gosh, I don't know how to explain it, make it a little bit more campy, a little more fun. And that's where we really start to see it with the suits. I think this silk shirt tie and kind of a satin fabric combo is hideous, but he's really changing the tone of who Hannibal is. This is him probably at his flashiest, and this is one of the very rare times we see him not wearing a vest. When we see Hannibal at home, Yes, please share. When we see him at home, he's often still wearing the vest and the pants from his suit. He's got a coral colored shirt on, which is a lot flashier than you would see probably on most American men. And then he's got his tie off, his shirt collar is open. He's relaxed and he's having a dinner party. So his suit colors are kind of amping up the flashiness. And also in this picture, his hair 
is a little bit less restrained. It's coming down across his forehead, which shows a sign that he's really relaxed. Whereas near the end of the season and in the very last episode, this is the first time we really see him with his hair slicked back in this severe style. He's got on probably the brightest, flashiest blue shirt and tie combo we see in all of season one. And this is where we see him walk into jail to see Will. He's the victor here. And from this point on, his suits are only going to get louder. And also if we look at this coat, this coat is either from a very high brand or it could be bespoke. You often see bespoke wool coats with the velvet collar. You can tell it's really high quality because it's got a perfect fit for him. The shoulders are in the right place. It's nicely rounded. He's really the victor here and he's feeling himself and showing it off. Which is why, let me find my season two images. Get my screen share. So in season two, we go right in and this suit, he's wearing a really pale color. He's got the tie, he's got the checkers. His hair is a little slick back a little bit more severe than the loose styles we see for most of season one. He's feeling like he's in charge and in control of the whole mind game he set up. So in season two, we really see him peacock with his style. We see things like the red suit which is my personal favorite. I know somebody asked about that at the start of the Q&A session. Is everything still going up here? Okay. Um, the red suit is definitely the most gaudy thing he wears. It really reminds me of animals when they're advertising that they're toxic. There'll be these really bright, loud colors. Like if you see a frog that has really psychedelic looking spots on it, it's telling you I'm poisonous. Don't touch me or you'll die. And I think this suit is probably the best example of Hannibal advertising his toxicity. And he can do that because he's got Will in jail. He's got Jack completely under his spell. This is really him at the height of his power, but without anybody besides Will knowing who and what he is. And I think that's why this is such a great look. And again, as we go on through this season, we get this suit where this is also a really loud pattern. It's a little bit 70s with the copper and the brown. He's showing off and he continues to do so. This is a really small image. I couldn't find a better one. Um, but this is him at his dinner party and he's wearing a velvet blazer and he's got a cravat, which is like a silk scarf that's tied and tucked under the shirt. He looks really relaxed and at home. And even though Jack is starting to suspect who he is, he's still pretty much in charge. As I throw my mouse onto the floor. And then, By the end of season one, you can see again, the bright orange shirt, the silk tie that's this bright orange and paisley, the brown suit, and his little pocket square that doesn't match anything else really except the blues in his tie. But again, he's still showing off, even though now Will knows who he is, Jack is suspecting him. 
And then let me see. That's my last one for season two. We're bringing us into season three. So in season three, he pretty much drops the suits aside from a couple of special dinner occasions. He's got the leather jacket. I think this outfit was really, really cool on him, but it's really interesting to see him starting out a new season in an outfit that's completely unlike anything we've ever seen him wear before. The sort of beast that's inside him is out. Everybody knows who he is. So now he doesn't have to dress up in suits anymore. He can really wear anything. He's got the loose hair. His hair's a little shaggy. Like you can see it behind his ears where it's grown out a bit. He can be casual because he's finally relaxed and released the true version of himself on the world. Which is how we end up with. So when we do see him wear suits, when he's masquerading as a professor, we see him in this style of suit. This suit is made out of linen, which is a very popular fabric in Italy because it's so thin, it wicks sweat away from your body, and it's really good for hot Italian summers. And I see somebody in the chat, Cheryl, mention that it's double-breasted. We only ever see him pull off a double-breasted suit when he's in Italy. And this is more of the Italian suit style where we've got these really dramatic lapels. We've got the dramatic double-breasted look, but the fabric is so casual because it's a linen, it wrinkles, it'll crumple, that it's kind of, it's a different atmosphere. He's, re again, he's relaxed and we see the shirt, he doesn't have a tie on. He only has a pocket square. The collar is unbuttoned. The hair is a little bit wild. I think it's a really nice look for him. We also get some really wild dinner looks. Like this weird, ugly Jack Skellington looking suit jacket. And this is again one of the only times he wears a bow tie. This suit is so so flashy because just like I've been reiterating, everybody knows who he is. There's no reason to hide. So he might as well pick the weirdest and wildest things possible. And one of my personal favorite fandom theories about some of his fashion choices in season three is that the grief of losing Will has kind of made his fashion sense go off the rails. So he's making some dangerous choices because he doesn't really give a shit anymore. Which is where we get him being really emo at a piano in this shirt with the weird wave print. He doesn't have a vest on. He doesn't have a tie on. This is one of the most relaxed looks I think that we ever see him in. And this shirt is really interesting because on the prop auction, I forget what brand it was, but it was a very expensive brand. So I think he was doing a little bit of eating his emotions through shopping. And then, let me fix my screen share. And then again, when he meets up with Jack, He's got another striped jacket on. He's got no tie. The collar is open. And it's again in the more Italian style. It looks like it's more of a linen to me. So it's a little more casual, but around Jack finally, he can advertise his toxicity through his patterns. But he can also be a little bit more casual in style because again, everybody knows who he is. He doesn't really care anymore. So this is, in Italy is really the last times that we ever see him in suit jackets because once he is captured and after the Mason Verger farm event adventure, we only ever see him in the prison suit and then in his little sweater and blazer 
in season three, we don't ever really see him in a three-piece suit like we did in seasons one and two, unless we're seeing him as imagined by Will. And so his character has kind of come from being completely under the radar in the pastel Easter suit. He's gone full circle through peacocking in three-piece suits, and he's finally able to be casual because everybody knows who he is. And I think it's just a really great display of a character changing through their clothing and also through their hair a little bit. And before I talk about my bespoke suit, I want to compare his style first to Jack and Dr. Chilton, and then also touch on characterization through the women's outfits, because I think that's really important. So, if we look, at Jack in a suit. There are three types of suit cut. There's British, there's Italian, and there's American. Hannibal's suits in season one and two, the three-piece, they are the British cut because, actually let me pull up my little diagram that shows the difference between the three really quick. So you can see here the three different suit types, British, Italian, American. The British suit is what you see on Hannibal in seasons one and two. You can see it's not double-breasted. It's got the really padded shoulders, which emphasize the width of the shoulders, but it's also got a more narrow waist, which emphasizes the narrowness of the waist. It has the two pockets on the side, and that upper pocket is called a ticket pocket. And that's where if you are riding the subway or riding a train, you would put your ticket in that little upper pocket so that when you get out or you have to show it to the train master, you can find it because it's the only thing that's in there. Um, the British style, it's a little bit more conservative. It's very slimming. Um, it involves probably the highest level of structure, and it's almost always wool. Whereas in the middle, the Italian suit, which is what we see Hannibal wearing in season three, it's often made out of linen. It's a very slim fit with a very dramatic lapel. It doesn't have all of the little flat pockets on the sides. It usually has slit pockets, so you don't really see them as much on the suit. It's really fashionable. It's good for dressing up to go out on a night on the town. It's not really your average work suit, but we see Hannibal wearing it for more casual occasions. Then the last one, which is very Jack, that's the American suit. And the American cut, it's very straight on the sides because it gives this illusion of a larger upper body. It's made to be kind of intimidating through size, but not so flashy. You can see the lapels are a little bit more narrow. They don't have that sharp peak that Hannibal often wears, but this is a suit that Jack does wear. It's also got the really broad shoulders. Brands like Hugo Boss, um, a lot of Armani suits, Calvin Klein suits, those are the American cut. And it kind of, it's the most old fashioned look. If you were going to meet somebody who's a banker, they're going to wear an American cut suit. Whereas somebody who's like in a really up and coming business, a younger guy, he's gonna wear the Italian or British cut. It's just a difference in image. And if we go back to Jack, let me go back, come here. You can see that Jack wears the American cut. He's got the really broad shoulders. He's very barrel chested. And often American suits don't include the vest. It's not a three piece, it's typically a two piece. So you can see he's wearing a belt. Now actually all of the suits in the show were bespoke. All of the shirts were also bespoke made by a defunct tailor called Antonio Valente. 
And um, even though they're bespoke, when you look at the characters in the show, I would say that Jack is more of a made to measure or even off the rack guy. He's not really somebody that's going to drop 10 grand on a bespoke suit. And just the look of his suits, it's a little bit more made to measure off the rack. It doesn't look as tightly tailored as what Hannibal wears. And then similarly with Dr. Chilton, he kind of wants to be Hannibal. He also goes for a British cut or sometimes an American cut that has a little more tapering in the sides. His outfits are a little flashy, but he doesn't have quite the style that Hannibal does. I could see Dr. Chilton dropping the cash on the bespoke suit, but considering all of the little details he chooses and how kind of plainly he wears it, he still can't compete with Hannibal. And we got another great image of Jack in the American cut there. And then really quick, something that I want to touch on is I'm going to use Alana for this because I forgot to download references of the other women and put them neatly in a file. But when we're watching the show, and if you think back about the images of the characters, the women and Will specifically are most often the victims of Hannibal's violence. And you can see their response to that in their clothes and in their hairstyling. Specifically with Alana, we see her start the series in these flowing wrap dresses. She's got her hair down and loose. She's a little relaxed and casual. With Freddie Lowndes, we see her, her outfits are a little flashy, but her hair's in its natural style. She just lets her own natural curls go. Margot, she's got long and loose hair. She's often wearing pants. Every now and then she pops up with a very severe style, but that's most often when she's around Mason. Bedelia, long and loose curls, A-line skirts, flowing wrap tops. And then also our, our male outlier, Will, he kind of, um, I mean, we all know Will from season one, dirty, shaggy dog man with his shaggy curls and his tops and his pants that are a little baggy on him, where he's not too worried about his style. But the interesting thing is that all of these people, as they experience Hannibal's violence and get drawn into this mental murder game, they start using their clothes kind of as armor and also their hair becomes more styled and severe. If we look at Alana by the end of the series, she's in pantsuits. Her hair is up and really tightly curled. She's got lipstick on in a color that matches her suit. Her outfits are really tailored. We also see this with Bedelia. Her curls become really tight and rigid. Her dresses are really form-fitting. Freddie Lowndes, her hair, she stops wearing her natural curls and has a more sculpted look. And because all of these people have experienced the terrible things Hannibal has done, they start changing as people and we really see that in their clothes. Even Will, his outfits become sleeker. His hair, they sculpt his curls a little bit more. And they're really using their outfits as armor against the people that they've experienced so many terrible things from. But anyways, that's where I'm going to stop talking about the clothes on the characters and characterization. And now I'm going to get into my suit. So let me get into my sewing techniques folder. I'm going to stop screen sharing for a minute. So I have my suit here with me and it looks a little sloppy on my dress form because my dress form's a little bit bigger than I am. So I can't really get the collar to close. It doesn't really fit. So forgive the sloppiness. Hannibal would not approve of this. 
Um, I decided to make this actually at Fanable Fest 1. I had made some of Margot's suit jacket. So I dabbled in couture laser sewing. And I was thinking, what's an outfit that nobody is crazy enough to make because it's impossible to get the fabric? What's a Hannibal you never see? And I immediately thought of this suit and I had to make it, so I did. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to strip him down and sort of slowly redress. We're gonna start with the inner layers and work our way out. Get this off. I'm gonna take the tie off, which I tied really badly because I suck at ties. Okay, this is my shirt. This shirt is from a British men's shirting company. Um, it's got a really wide collar. This is called a spread collar and Hannibal wears spread collars because Hannibal likes big knots. So his tie knots are always huge and we need the space so that we got the spread collar just to leave room for that big old Balthus knot. Um, he also tends to wear a very slim cut shirt. Um, there's some darts in the back. It's very slim through the sides and the hips because he's wearing so many layers that you don't want a lot of extra fabric underneath. It's just going to bunch and it's going to look sloppy and it's going to feel sloppy. So you really need the very slim cut. With the, the um, cuffs, this is called a barrel cuff. It's really wide, it's notched at the bottom, and the buttons on it work. So he could unbutton and he could roll up his sleeves. They're nice and stiff, and they show really, really well under the um, sleeve of the shirt. And they don't use cufflinks. You wouldn't typically use cufflinks during the day. That's more of a dinner look. So that's why he's got the nice little buttons. Next, we have the vest. Let me get this back on. Now, he makes some interesting choices with his vest as I button it up the wrong way. Button, button, button. So, Hannibal's vest. They're very often double-breasted. No real reason, just a style that he likes. He tends to wear the shawl collar, which is this rounded collar, because that takes up a lot of room on the chest so that when he's got his tie on, you don't see a lot of the shirt. He wants the fancier parts like his tie, his pocket square, and his vest to take up the most real estate on his body. Um, the way that the vest is made, I'll get into this more when I start talking about the suit jacket, but a vest is actually a really complicated piece to make. There's a lot of interfacing, which is just a way of stiffening the fabric that goes into the collar and goes into the chest. And the really important part about his vest, which is one of the most difficult things to get and get right is this fabric that's on the back. This is the exact fabric that is used in the show. It's called, um, it can be called cupro, and what it is is it's a type of viscose, and it's really silky and shiny, and this is the Cadillac of linings. This is the best fabric you can use to line a vest or a jacket, because it's really silky, it slips really well, so the jacket's going to slide on nicely over his back. It's never going to bunch. Um, it's also going to fit really nicely to the body. And he uses these really special slides, which is kind of hard for me not to distort it. But he uses these also on his pants. 
This is a double buckle slide. These are really hard to find outside of Europe. This fabric is hard to find outside of Europe. And so what he's saying with his suits, not only through the cut and through the materials, is that he is very European. He is probably going to Seville Row to get his suits made. He's advertising his money and his style through these choices. Now, one other important detail is on my vest, we have eight buttons. On Mads's vest, we have 10 buttons. Now, I could have gone screen accurate and done the exact number of buttons that he has, but when I think about cosplay, I think about proportions and how important it is to have great proportions to make you look like the character. Mads is six feet tall, and he's actually a little bit skinnier even than I am, so I can't fit that number of buttons on my stomach. Eight looked a lot better. If I went with 10, I'd have had to use a smaller button, which looks really weird, and I'd had to cram them in. So this gives the best Hannibal impression on me versus going completely one-to-one -one with the screen. These buttons, they're made out of horn. So like an actual animal's horn has been filed down. Each one is individually sewn on. And what the double breasted and the double buttons look does is when his jacket is open, it gives the illusion of more height to his body. He wants to be physically intimidating with his height. We see this when he talks to Bedelia. He walks toward her and draws himself up, and he's using his full physical height, but also the illusion that his suit gives that he is bigger to intimidate her. So that's why he's got this really nice two rows of buttons. It just draws your eye up and down. We also have the tie, which I made myself. I redrew this off of the actual tie pattern. I had this printed on silk. The inside of the tie is just cotton flannel. And when you make a tie, the really important thing is you never want to push down with an iron because that'll give that really crisp edge. You want it soft, so you just make it with steam and actually Ties are really, really easy to make. Anybody could make a tie. All you do is fold up the fabric, sew it up the back by hand. I used silk thread because Hannibal is extra and would also use silk thread. And yeah, it's really easy. And I'm really bad at tying ties. When I go to conventions, I always find a man with a nice tie and ask him to tie it for me. But um. This is the Balthus knot. I'm gonna screen share really quick. And let me find, hold on. I have a little guide to different knots. Screen share, screen share. Here we go. These are different tie knots. The simple knot is really small. He's using this green one, the Balthus knot. It's bigger, it takes up the most space. It's not a Windsor, it has to be the Balthus if you're going to be Hannibal. But going back, now I'm going to talk about the jacket. So the jacket is really the most important part of the whole getup. Hannibal likes, it's called um, a wing lapel, a notch lapel. It's just very a dramatic pointy lapel that spreads out across the chest. And the way that it spreads out so far, it almost comes to the shoulder. And so that when it tapers in at the waist, it's adding to the illusion that he has broad shoulders and a little bitty snatched waist. 
So I want to screen share the insides of a bespoke jacket so that you can understand how much work goes into this. So let me find screen share. This is a good example of the inside of a bespoke jacket. This is like in the making process. What you see here is these are the bags for the pockets. There's a layer of what's called HIMO or hair canvas, which I'll show you in a minute, my piece that I have. That is what's used to create the stiffness and the structure on the front of the jacket. On top of that, you see, this is probably wool felt. There's some different materials people use, but wool felt is used on the chest to keep it smooth. And also if you have like an oddly shaped chest, they can use the felt to pad it out and make it really even across the front, more illusions. The little tiny stitches you see are pad stitching, which I'll come back to in a second. You can see that the canvas extends to the lapels. There's a little bit of what's called stay tape, which is just to make the fabric not stretch. And all of this has to be hand sewn. You cannot do any of this on a machine. So somebody has to sit and take the time to do this for all of his suits. Now, pad stitching, So these are little teeny tiny baby stitches. You sit with your hair canvas and you hand sew so that only a tiny stitch sews, shows on the outside. And this really makes your outer fabric and the inner facing become one fabric. So that when the lapel rolls, you can see here, there's not a sharp crease, it's just a very soft roll. It should flop open and do that naturally. And you also do pad stitching on the collar to make the collar stiff and to make the collar roll naturally. You never want a sharp crease on your suit. Again, more handwork, more money, more time. And this is what the pad stitching looks like on the outside. This is on like a really heavy wool fabric, like for a coat, but it's in areas where the fabric will be folded over and you won't see it. But you can see how it kind of knits the two fabrics together. If we go back, I'm gonna stop sharing. I talked about hair canvas. This is what it is. It's canvas and these little gray lines you can see in it are actually um, strands from either a horse's mane or a horse's tail. And that just, it makes a nice stiff fabric that still bends. You can use steam or heat to teach it which direction to bend and stay bent in. This is a lot better then say if you go to your local fabric store, you'll get fusible interfacing, which is like a felt fabric with glue on the back and you iron it and it glues to the fabric. That shit's terrible. When you wash it, it's liable to shrink and get wrinkly. If you wash it too many times, it'll pull away from the fabric. It's okay for like everyday wear clothes, but if we're talking about suits, you don't want to use the fusible interfacing. You want to use the hair canvas. And one more important thing about his suits is the buttonholes. So let me show you. On my Hannibal suit, I have around 38 buttonholes. Each buttonhole is sewn by hand. This is how you do it. You cut the hole, you sew quickly around the hole, and then you go around again on top of a piece of cording. And as you sew, you make these little knots at the edge, which reinforces it. And um, it just strengthens the buttonhole. It makes it look really nice. And each one takes me 
and I'm not a professional, about seven to 10 minutes to make. If you multiply that by 38 buttonholes, you're looking at hours of work and they have to be done by hand. You don't wanna do this on a machine. So somebody has to sit there and do all of the buttonholes for his suits. This on the lapel, mine's terrible. It's called a Milanese buttonhole. It's just a different style of sewing that makes it look really silky and shiny. It's really, really difficult. So you have to spend more money to get that Milanese buttonhole on your lapel. And finally, I'm gonna talk about the pants really quick. Now, if you're writing a Hannibal fan fiction and you're writing Hannibal taking off his pants and you write that Hannibal undoes his belt, if he is wearing a three-piece suit, he would never undo a belt. He would always have suspenders or braces on. So you can actually see a glimpse of those in the um, behind the scenes of the show. Mads raises his arms and you can see it. We don't want clip-on suspenders. Those are cheap, those will crease your pants. You want the ones that you have to sew on buttons. And the reason you don't wanna wear a belt when you're wearing a vest is it just creates a lump at the waist and that's like an additional layer. It's a lot better to have the suspenders underneath of the vest, it's a lot smoother. It makes it really hard to go to the bathroom because you have to take off all of your layers to pull down your pants. But um, yes, always suspenders. He also has hip slides. Now this is where, instead of wearing a belt, he has these because you can pull it and it tightens up the sides of your pants. Again, we have the double buckle that is really only found in Europe. He's saying, I'm European, I have a lot of money. The interior of the pants, is lined with the cupro. The lining goes down below the knee. And this is so that when you're wearing them, if you don't have a lining, the exterior fabric is going to take stress when you bend your knee. Eventually you'll get a shiny spot on the knee because of having the fabric stretch so much. The lining, because it goes down so low, it does all of the bending and it protects the exterior fabric so that you pretty much won't ever get that weird stretch mark in your knee. And the last important part of the suit is the pants length. Now I can't put these on and really show you, so I am going to show you a series of quick pictures. Um, One important thing we have to look at is the break, which is how long the pants is. A full break is very old fashioned. Hannibal typically wears a half break or a quarter break, so you only get a little crease above the shoe. No break is very, very modern, very, very young man looking. What the break does is when it's on Hannibal, this quarter break or the half break, I'll show you, It, it makes his legs look longer. If you had a lot of fabric at the ankle, his legs would look shorter, but because it's a very slim cut all the way through, he looks a little bit taller than he even usually is. Um, on my pants, I'm really short. I did the quarter break because that's what made my legs look the longest. His pants are also a little bit tapered at the size to emphasize that itty bitty skinny Mads Mikkelsen dancer body. So, I wanna have time for questions. There's a little more detailing that goes into a suit, but it's not so much important about the shoulders. Um, in really quick in the shoulders, there's also what's called a shoulder roll. It's just a little bit of cotton wadding rolled up and it's hand sewn in and it keeps this shoulder nice and round so it doesn't crease and it doesn't collapse. It stands out at the side, just makes it look a little nicer. It's a couture and bespoke detail. But that's about all I have to say. I wanna bring Nikki back 
so that if you guys have questions, I can answer them really, really quick. Hi. Okay. Hi. Um, great. Um, so it's, I really had no idea that the suits were that, that <laughs> and it, it just made me think about how upset he was and pouty when they had taken his suits away um, to, you know, to investigate them and kind of yes. <laughs> explain Those are $10,000 each, plus his watch is a Patek Philippe which is one of the fanciest, oldest watch brands. It's Swiss made, it's the same family for centuries. That's what the true richest rich people wear. His watch is about $50,000. Wow. So only um, somebody who is old money would recognize that brand and know that he is wearing the price of a very nice car on his wrist. I had seen someone in chat also mention that they were surprised about the shirts on the show themselves being uh, bespoke, which they are. Um, and I have one from the auction and all the suit, the shirts have a little HL or WG in them. Yep. They're all monogrammed. A good bespoke suit or a shirt always has a monogram in it. Um, yeah. Hannibal's suits on the show have the monogram right inside here on the breast. All right. So I'm going to take some questions now. Um, uh, the, you mentioned, you talked about the tie, but Julian wants to know how you managed to get the red window pane fabric. Um, so the red window pane, it's a wool fabric. You always want wool for a Hannibal suit, never polyester, because wool is the fabric that if you put heat or steam on it, you can shape it. You can take a square of wool and steam it and literally curve it to your head to make a hat. So when you've got these really nice rolls here, you want a wool. So what I did is I bought wool fabric. I got like 10 yards because I was afraid of fucking it up. And this is um, screen print ink. And I used ratios to figure out exactly how big the window panes were on Mads calculated it off a picture to get the right size of the window panes. And then I used painter's tape and I had to tape out each line and I had to screen print every single line. And I had to do it so that the pattern matches. If you notice, and that's another detail of Hannibal suits that make them so expensive, the lines always perfectly match perfectly everywhere. Match. So that uses more fabric, costs more money, takes more time, and that's how you get a Hannibal suit. Wow. Um, so Colleen, hi Colleen, uh, wants to know if the hair canvas is difficult to source. Um, it's not. There's a website called Wawak, and if you DM me, I can link it to you. But they have sewing and tailoring supplies. You can get it really easily. It's just really expensive. For about a yard of hair canvas, you're going to spend 30 to $40. And the hair canvas is in the chest, it's in the lapels, it's in the lapels on the vest, the chest of the vest, and every single pocket flap. So you need quite a bit. Wow. I'd like to know, I don't know if you have these at hand or can post them later on Twitter if you have photos of yourself wearing the suit, which I, I know you do. I will show you right now. If I can screen share. That's me at the first Red Dragon Con where I wore it. So yeah, you can see that I have the quarter break. I have the handful long toe shoes. He wears his jackets open, but if you button the jacket, you only ever button the top button. You don't button the bottom one because then if you sit down with it buttoned, the jacket can spread. It's not strained so much. But yeah, that's me. Okay. Uh, and Caitlin would like to know how long it took you to make the suit. Um, so the first Fanable Fest was in October. I started the day I returned, I returned. And I worked on it up to January. It took about three months of working on it almost every day. Oh, well, okay. So, um, just a couple more. Oh, yeah, Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. Um, would like to know, um, in a more, you know, not in a cosplay sense, but like an actual suit 
making mm-hmm. sense. Um, how long uh, Hannibal would have to wait for one and what is involved in the appointments? How many times would he need to go in for fittings? So as far as the amount of time goes, it depends on how many people are working at the shop. If there's only one guy working, he's probably going to wait about a month for it to get finished because there's going to be other orders to do. With experience, you can bust these things out a little bit faster, but it's going to take some time. And also the reason it takes about a month is he's going to go in for a first fitting, which is where they take the measurements and make the pattern. He'll go for a second fitting, which is where it's not sewn together, it's just pinned or basted. He'll try it on, some adjustments. He'll come in for a third fitting where it's all sewn together, and if there's anything that's not quite right, they'll adjust it again. At the fourth and final fitting, that's when they'll hem the pants and he'll be ready to take it home. Okay. Um, I want to just get a couple more questions in. I don't want to go too far over the hour because I also just want to remind people that the uh, hashtag dining Netflix event is starting now, so we're just going to do a couple more questions. Um, and so, uh, Sophie would like to know if you have any insight, um, or read any insight from the costume designer, um, especially in regards to how they were able to pull off such expensive suits, um, what, you know, what their budget was like, how did they, obviously they spent a lot of money doing this, um, you know, any, any insight or anything you've heard about that? Um, well, while Christopher Hardigan was the main costume, like, he was the boss of the costume department. Um, Hannibal's suits were actually made at two, or I think there's a third one that's now closed down. There's three tailoring shops they were made at. One of them is Tower Bespoke. He's really nice. Follow him on Instagram because he shows you behind the scenes how he's making his suits. Um, But yeah, I don't know too much about how they balance the budget. You can't really get the fabric any cheaper. I would guess if they're contracting with each suit maker, because they're buying in bulk, they might have been able to arrange some kind of discount, but you're really paying for someone's time to do it all by hand. So they're probably still spending, I would guess, a minimum of $5,000 on each one. You oh can't keep out on it because it's all handmade. But that reminds me of at Fanable Fest when we visited the Verger house. One of the ladies conducting the tour said that in one dinner scene, they used $10,000 worth of truffles for each take. They threw the truffles out after every take every because the bite was taken out of them. At the end of the day, around $100,000 of truffles were used and thrown out. So uh, if they can waste that much on truffles, by all means, they can invest in the suits. That's um, in, amazing. <laughs> that's okay, also so- probably why it's hard to get a season four. Brian's budgets are Game of Thrones big. Mm, just amazing. throwing that out there. That's amazing. So one last question um, from uh, Masha asking, considering the amount of masquerading Hannibal does, what do you think he really likes to wear? Ooh, (laughs) I think he really does like to wear the suits because there's so much showing off and they're so nice and so sleek. Like he just looks good in them. But honestly, if he's sitting around the house, I think that finale episode, that really nice soft sweater, a really nicely fitted pair of wool cashmere slacks, I think that's what he's wearing in his off time. If he goes out to to get something, he'll wear one of his bespoke wool coats over top. But yeah, the comfy sweater, the pajama sweater, expensive, but still a little more chill. Awesome. All right, I think we're gonna start. And like I said, I just wanna remind everybody uh, to check out the hashtag with Netflix tag. And this was just absolutely wonderful and fascinating. And I know, other people in the chat, you know, said uh, this, I, I, the same way, is it like anybody who got something from the prop, like, you know, you were got really like, good at a really good price. Those suits went for like a thousand dollars. You got a ten thousand dollars for a ten percent price. So, so you got really good. Um, actually, guys, if you have any more questions, 
please DM me on Twitter. I love to talk about this stuff. I will answer everything you want to know. So just message me. My DMs are open. Oh, thank you so much. And uh, to Fanable Fest for hosting. And, uh, yeah, wonderful. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you, guys.